All right, this is my uh, elderly video from my Nutrition 300 classes. So I've, I've downloaded the file once again. I know I keep saying this and I'm going to continue to say it to bother my students, but you have to download the PowerPoints, open them up in Google Drive, and then you can see the notes that go with the slides because sometimes those notes have far more detail than I can go into in these short videos. I'm going to go slideshow. So the elderly are an interesting population. They're very much like um, pregnant women and infants. It's, it's not a demographic you can easily do research in, in terms of changing their diet, looking at an outcome. That's called intervention, interventional research. Uh, mostly it's observational, where you, you see who is eating what, who is doing what, and you kind of, and you look at outcomes, or you interview people who have had outcomes, and you try to back calculate what did they do, what did they eat. Uh, we're, you know, we have a level of elderly in the United States and on the planet that have never existed on the earth before. Um, so when you start to talk about elderly or older, usually older starts at 51. So the, the RDAs are set in, in kind of age groups. There's like infants, there's 18 to 50, male, female, 51 and older. And then even after like 70, 75, you start getting kind of different, different values. Um, Again, <laughs> we are pretty much taking adult information that we have gleaned from animals and extrapolating that, like we do for medication, to infants and toddlers and kids and older Americans. Do we have a ton of vitamin B6 data that has been manipulated in a 70-year-old population? No, we don't, okay? And older Americans aren't like younger Americans. Older Americans have medications. They have had diseases. They have a disease. Um, so they're affected by not only their medical conditions, um, how their medical conditions may affect the way their, their dietary intake is affected. So it maybe it increases or decreases the absorption of some things. Medications affect how long nutrients can stay in the body. Being on a diuretic, you may be peeing out electrolytes more often. All these make it a very complicated subject in terms of subject as not, not in terms of, uh, of material, but in terms of people, a subject population that is just kind of uh, very hard to generalize. And if you're going into medicine, you're, you're going to have to have a, you will have to have a very individualized approach to each patient coming through the door. What, what is their medical history? What medications are there on? are they on what diseases do they currently have do they take pain medications pain medications we know can affect the gi tract so um far more complicated i would say with less information than your typically your typical 18 to 50 year old look everyone's getting older uh medicine is a great thing and it's allowing us all to live older and older and older but it puts human beings into a into a stratosphere that has never existed before 85 and older is one of the fastest growing demographics in the history of the world there haven't been a lot of 85 year olds yes in the olden days people lived to 85 very few people lived to 85 is another one of these great charts i think this is from the uh the un right so um you know this is the way it used to be in the early days there were lots of young folks and less older people and now this is 6.9 we've just hit we've just hit nine eight billion i think so right the, the curve is changing people just keep living which is good but it's also it's problematic as well so the first thing we notice in the elderly and we talked about this for for body composition you know what drives metabolism is lean muscle mass the elderly lose a lot of lean muscle mass you can continue to gain extra body fat as you get older not necessarily um, and the importance of that may be in terms of disease risk after 75 may be less important the, as the as the adage goes, if weight was going to kill you and it didn't, and you're 75, then weight's not going to kill you. Um, but this this decrease in muscle mass makes for frailty. It lowers the metabolism. Uh, there's a term called sarcopenia, which translates to poverty of the flesh. And and you find folks who are very very frail, even if someone is is uh, overweight, there's less muscle there than you think there is. And then other things that are going on that are all impacted by nutrition, well, that we have to think about in terms of nutrition. Infl uh, your immune response, it's slower in the elderly. Uh, so when they get the flu or they get the cold, they're, they're slower to react. They may have a, a worse outcome. 
before COVID, it wasn't COVID killing the elderly during the wintertime. It was the flu. We see some minerals and vitamins are specifically deficient in the elderly. Zinc is one of them. B12 is one of them. Um, zinc is found typically in protein-rich foods. The elderly may be on fixed incomes and not eating protein-rich foods. Protein-rich foods often, especially if it's animal tissue, are interestingly hard to chew and eat. If they have dental issues uh, it, when you're older, it's it's it makes it harder for them to eat those kinds of foods. So, you know, zinc may not be uh, coming in at, at the amount we like. B12 is found in animal tissues. The elderly tend to have a weaker GI tract. The ability to break down animal tissue that has B12 is, is slower, is weaker. Um, that's actually called atrophic gastritis, this entire process of, 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 of a weaker GI tract, gut bacteria moving into the small intestine. Um, the stomach itself becomes like more hollowed out, if you will. So that increases your risk for B12 deficiency. Thirst response. The elderly have a weaker thirst response. They are more likely to be dehydrated. That's why when you go to the state fair, who's in the nursing tent? Usually little kids and, the, and older folks. Like I said, dental issues. That affects your ability to eat food. Um, here's this whole part of this weakened um, GI tract where there's less, less acid made. The ability to break down food is less. That means the ability to, to liberate nutrients is less. And then that results in things not getting absorbed. And then these all go into the whole, you know, the whole things that affect in, uh, food intake. Income is one of them. We know there's a lot of mental health disease in the elderly. That's a demographic, by the way, which I've said before when it came to eating disorders, who are less likely to seek help. Um, dental is a big deal. There, so I, I, I'm, many elderly don't have a dental plan. There is no national dental insurance plan for the elderly, uh, like Social Security or, or, or Medicare. And dental, dental care is very expensive, and that does create a great limitation. Um, swallowing, by the way, is an issue that if you, if you get into patients who have Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, not only do they have cognitive loss, like memory loss, you know, over time their body starts to forget how to work. You know, for my father-in-law, he forgot how to walk, and he became wheelchair-bound, not because there was some damage to his legs or... Um, you know, some connection from his brain to his legs. He just forgot how to walk. And this also affects swallowing. The, the difficulty of swallowing uh, in the elderly can end up being their demise because what happens is they inhale, they aspirate food into their lungs, and then they get really, really sick because of that. Th this swallowing is a big deal in geriatrics. And those of you who've been around folks who have dementia or Alzheimer's, it is a constant concern. So what do we do? How do we try to help folks? You got to screen, right? So, you know, when folks get at a certain age, a oh, little update coming in on my computer, a video game. Um, if you can't treat a disease unless you measure a disease, right? This is the idea of intravascular ultrasound where you can measure plaques in the arteries. So we do have some programs. Yes, there's, there's your local food bank, food stamps or SNAP. Um, the two biggest ones are Meals on Wheels. This is a volunteer program where volunteers provide food uh, to homebound seniors. It, it may not be every day. It can be every day. And the, the idea is that that one meal you bring to somebody um, meets a certain percent of their RDA needs for the day. The problem with Meals on Wheels, of course, is it is a volunteer program. And when gas prices go up, you lose a lot of volunteers. So if, if you're thinking about uh, donating to a charity for the wintertime, this is not a bad charity, your local Meals on Wheels. The, the, the elderly nutrition program is a little different. These are usually meals that are at a, VA, uh, a, a VFW or, or a VA center or a community center, and they're, they're congregate. So, you, so elderly can take a bus, the bus may pick folks up, bring them there for a lunch, and then people are interacting. So you don't, you don't just receive some sort of nutritional benefit. You receive an emotional, mental benefit. You're around other people. You can interact. We know that loneliness leads to depression, leads to the lack of appetite, and leads to malnutrition in the elderly. And this is one way to overcome that nutritional endpoint by by helping the starting point, which is loneliness, right? So interaction. These are both really critical. Um, and, and, and they're great programs at the local level. 
And then if you're caring for older folks, and this is getting a little long, I apologize. Uh, it does take a little bit of, of planning. You have to make sure there are meals that are not too big and won't intimidate them. Uh, make sure there's there, the meal sizes are, uh, sometimes you, you can set Tupperware for elderly, so it's not a big amount of food and they don't get intimidated. Um, you wanna make sure that the foods have a lot of flavor because the taste response also goes down as we get older. That's why you'll find older folks will make foods really vinegary and really salty because they're trying to overcome their inability to taste um, their food. And we don't want them relying on salt. We would prefer they use things like seasonings and 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 other kind of, of flavorful manipulations of their food other than just salt dependent all the time. Um, just like kids, flavors, colors, shapes, textures, smells, those are all important for eating. Make sure that the texture is palatable so they can actually eat the food. Um, you can't complain that your grandparents don't eat well if you're not going over there to eat with them. Try to set, yes, a time one day a week at least maybe that you go out for dinner or you go over there to eat or you invite them over to your house to eat. It's important not only emotionally to have the family together, but it's important to help that person to eat well. And you can kind of, you know, it's a way that you can check up on an older person, see how well they're eating, ask them questions. How are you doing? Um, it, it's, you know, these meal settings are important, especially when you're trying to get little kids to learn how to eat well and then older human beings to continue to eat well. All right, so that is it for this. It's not a big block. It's one video. It's 11. It's going to be 12 minutes, so I apologize. <laughs>